For those of you who've worked with Ogilvy, some of you might know that this agency is an agency that is very much around research whenever we do anything that we do. So whenever we talk to clients, we never do anything which is not grounded in a solid strategy, which is not grounded in anything, and, and something where we've talked to users, to consumers before, so we know what's relevant of what we're doing for them. Um, and so when we, when we talk to um, when we talk about mobile, we've, we've understood in the past years when the whole, there's a lot of mobile agencies there, there's a lot of agencies that talk mobile, and everybody's talking about platforms and technologies and devices. Um, we're trying to talk to clients and tell them, you know what, forget all that, that's part of the discussion when it, when it comes to execution. We need to be here around understanding consumer behavior. Um, for us, mobile is something that underlines everything that we've already done, which underlines business strategies, uh, which underlines marketing programs that we're doing, which accelerates these programs, and it's no nothing that stands on the side of it, which is an executional silo that you just have to add on to campaigns. So, also, if you, if you know Ogilvy, uh, you know we're all about selling. Um, for us, it's about you know, selling the product of the client. Um, that is what we're being paid for, and we, we take credit that we're doing quite a good job. This thing doesn't work right now. So um, we went out and when we when we looked at selling, we said, "What is one of the hot topics that's being you know that's being talked about in terms of mobile right now?" And one of the topics, if you read all the newspapers and the headlines, um, it's about how shopping behavior is being changed or how it's changing right now because people now have cell phones in their pockets while they're at the retail. So um, we looked around, and one of the first things that we actually found and that we saw um, was this little ad in the UK. Quarter growth should continue at the current at the current rate, which. Tell me that you love me. Shh. I'm sorry. The free Tesco grocery app lets you order from your iPhone and has a new barcode scanner so you can pop products into your online basket in one click. Oh, hang on. I'm going to order a bottle of phone. Excuse me. We've run out of those too. From your scan to our van. Tesco.com. Every little helps. So... This is life, this is UK. Um, you can do that, you can scan your stuff, it goes into your shopping basket, and when you, f when you feel your shopping basket is full, um, you just check out and it's gonna get delivered to your home. Great stuff. Is this what the world is right now? Is this what we're living in? Well, if you, if you listen to some research and if you, if you look around, you find a lot of companies that bring out numbers right now that tell you the story that with smartphones, the world is so great. Everybody's price comparison shopping. Everybody is scanning barcodes at retail. Um, the whole world has already changed. Um, if you do look, though, behind the numbers and you look a little bit, if you, if you try to understand what it is, it says, and this is some research that I don't even know what exactly it was, but in a December survey conducted for the NRF, about 11% of shoppers said they had used a smartphone for holiday shopping. Of those who did, 26% made a purchase, 34% read progress, and so on and so forth. So if you do a little bit of math beyond it, it actually the numbers are rather small behind it. So we're like, maybe there is some truth right now in the marketplace that is not so much portrayed by the press or how some companies would like to see it. Um, so we figured we, we wanted to know what is the truth right now, where are we? And um, something that we came up with is we need to clear some fog for what the reality is of today. And I mean, I know this is about the future and we'll talk about the future just in a second, um, but we needed to understand right now because clients are ta tasking us, we need that shopping app and with this and this and this and this. And we said, well, you know what? We need to understand though what, where your mass, your mass audience really is at the moment. So um, what is today's reality in terms of shopping? We went out and we talked to some, first of all, we talked to some um, pretty senior folks within some of the organizations organizations that we felt could have an opinion on those. And um, so we talked to some folks from, from App Nation, from Infineon, from Impact Mobile, which are uh, partially agencies that do a lot of like messaging services around the point of sale. We talked to, um, to operators like AT&T, to O2 in, in the UK. Um, we talked to companies like Coca-Cola and to Anheuser-Busch, um, also to Gap and Ikea. So we had some retail perspective. And obviously, you have to talk to Google and Facebook just to understand where the platforms are in this moment. Um, and they provided us all with great insight around where they thought mobile was right now, where they thought mobile was going. Um, they also um, provide a lot of insights into there's a huge 
amount of confusion in the market. Nobody knows what the return of investment is at the moment when you invest in anything that's mobile advertising related. Um, and they provided us with a great set of questions. And we figured, well, why don't we take these questions that all these people have and we actually do some little more research around it. So we went out, we uh, did a, uh, an online panel with 1,500 consumers in the US, in the UK, and in Singapore in the markets. And we went out because online panels tell a certain part of the truth and a certain part of the stories. But we also went out and did some video research and we actually sent a camera team basically um, to some of the very, very early adopter markets where we felt at least that they were early, early, early adopter markets. Um, most of those uh, we found actually in the Stanford University Mall, which is uh, obviously Silicon Valley. So it's very close to where you have a lot of those people um, using smartphones. And um, what this shows us, or what it showed us, actually the research, is a very, very typical adoption curve. This is nothing special. This is your typical bell curve where you have um, the innovative the opinion leaders, the early majority, the late majority, and the laggards. And what we as marketers always think, you know, it's great to do stuff here. This is for the cons and the Clios and of the world. This is where you do, uh, this is where you get your press if you're an agency. But what's really, really relevant to our clients is if you get these people. This is where you make the money. And this is, at the end of the day, what it's all about for us. And we looked at, so where is the behavior? What's the adoption that we're seeing in the market right now? And if you look at it, and um, this comes from the research, in the innovators area, which is 5% of all the consumers that we're seeing right now, um, this is what they're doing. So these are, and this is a random sample of all the stuff that we've asked for. Um, for example, they're using Blackberries and Androids. They're very social. They use My Daily Deal. They use Yelp as an app. I don't know if uh, you all know Yelp, probably from the US. It's uh, something where you, uh, where you can check into your neighborhood and you see all the stores and restaurants and rate and reviews um, where you can check check in. They use opinions and Zappos, and for us, really relevant, um, they use something like Next Tag and Red Laser. So this is where barcode scanning happens. This is the innovators group right now. They're the ones actually going to the store, scanning the barcode, looking at the price comparison. The next, the opinion leaders, this is another 15%. So right now, we're just talking about 20% overall. Is um, They're the ones, they own an iPhone. They might have an intent to buy a Kindle. Uh, they use City Search and Twitter and LinkedIn and BizRate. They do use Google um, to search um, within a store for some product information. So this still is 20% of the overall market that we're talking to. They do QR code scanning or barcode scanning. This is the part that for a large amount of marketers is really, really relevant. And this is where they just started to own smartphones, likely to buy an iPad. This is where they use Groupon. So Groupon has actually made the jump into the early majority of the market. Late majority, they're the ones, they've become a fan of a brand on Facebook. So something like, okay, social media obviously is something that has been broadly adopted. That's no news to us right now in the market. And then obviously there's some laggards and they're the ones who, holy shit, there's Craigslist and there's eBay. That must be something that's really, really inventive. But this tells a very clear story, which is some of what we read in the press and some of what we see right now is very, very much an early adopters or an innovators area. It is nothing that is of relevance right now as we speak. The big question is how can we foresee and how, um, how fast do certain services or technologies actually um, move through so that they actually become part of what we look at the early or the late majority, so the, the markets that we need to. Um, what we see is a very, very clear trend, and this is something that came out, and this is just one example that we pulled out. There's a very clear trend that mobile behavior follows online behavior. So anything that we've seen on, on online behavior, as for example, e-commerce, is something we do see that um, following and that trend. And this is not just our study. There's actually quite a lot of research out there that, that shows this. Um, and you can see very clearly, so if you say, looked at a product in store and then bought it online, you can see across the various groups, uh, 85%, 74%, 66%. But then if you look at it, looked at a product in store and then bought it on the phone, you have a, a drop even in the opinion leaders group to 27% and then to 8% um, in the early majority. So how do we know that something is actually moving over and how do we know how fast something is moving over? Um, there is uh, um, the important or the, 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 uh, the well-known fact about crossing the chasm. So behavior or services that are being adopted, they need to cross this chasm. This is actually the most critical one. And um, the question is, how do we know how fast it does this? 
services have to answer certain questions, so to say, um, if we want to understand this. And one of them is, is this something that is trusted? Um, one of the questions we asked in the research was, um, which ones of these brands would you trust to do your financial transactions for you? Um, the first ones rated were Visa, MasterCard, Amex, PayPal. No surprise, they're companies well respected for handling financial transactions. Um, the ones ranked lowest on those, Facebook and Apple because they have a serious trust issue. Obviously, Facebook with all the data transactions, but that might explain why Facebook right now is not launching its Facebook's credits uh, in, a, in a larger scheme. But they have to overcome the trust gap before they actually make it to a broader scheme um, in this area. Also, there's something, is this a learned behavior? Um, there is one learned behavior that has translated very, very fast into the early majority, which is search. Everybody knows how to use Google on a desktop. There's nothing I have to learn in addition to this to using Google on a cell phone, which means I can, this is search, mobile search has just been blasting through and it is already part of the late majority. It's also something, is this something that is really needed? This is something uh, that we'll talk to about utility. Is this something that really helps me in anything or is it just adding complexity? And here's an example of um, where you could ask those questions, and if you answer those questions, you might come to certain conclusions. I don't know, do you all know Shopkick in the, in the, from the US? Shopkick is an app um, that allows you to check into retail locations when you walk around cities, and check into products. Um, you actually have to be in the store, though, and then you check in and you gain points for that, and you can exchange those points for loyalty. Uh, you can exchange them for Facebook credits later on. Um, and first, I, I downloaded it, and I did it, and I walked around um, in, in Manhattan, and I thought, this is some good stuff, and then I closed the app and I never opened it again. I was kind of like, mm, well, maybe it didn't give me enough value for this. And I was just recently at an MMA forum, and uh, there was this 50-year-old consultant who sat there and, and who brought this up and said, you know, the question why certain services don't reach the tipping point of where they go into the early and the late majorities is because what this app does, it doubles the time that I spend at the retail. Now, do I really want to double the time that I spend in a supermarket? Or is a supermarket actually something where I want to go through in a very, very fast way? So there's a question if um, services like this are a beginning of something that we see, but they might not have been thought through all the way where they actually add value to life without adding complexity or adding something more. So, that is what we, what, we can, what we can see today. And I mean, the research even covered Singapore, which is a fairly um, uh, valid, uh, advanced market. But if we want to look ahead, and I said we, we did video ethnography interviews um, in markets like the Stanford Mall, um, we can see certainly what the behavior will be and what the foreshadowing is in the future. And here's a little uh, clip from um, the interviews that we've done. And these are, and agencies sometimes do these things, they fake uh, some of those. This is all true interviews. There was a, a chicken dish with broccoli. I forgot what the ingredients were. I was able to go on the Whole Foods uh, app and see what the ingredients were and purchase what I needed. It's, I think it's like called karma or something like that. Whenever you check in, you say you have people and you spend X money, and they donate money towards like planting a tree. There's different things you can pick. And as you build up and you say you get X amount of points, you can pick which one you want to spend it on. Most of the time I use my phones just to compare uh, prices when I go shopping. I have an eBay thing, so application for barcode scanning, like barcode scanner or shop savvy. If I'm at the store and I see something I like, so it's impulse, immediately take out my iPhone and start checking. Uh, I usually check for price because I want to see what I get ripped off. I'll either Google for it or I'll uh, look up the product on Newegg and look at reviews. I've used Yelp to compare what's a good automotive shop to like take my car to, um, what else for restaurants. So here are my products on my shopping list within the Sephora app. If I ever run out of something, it's easy to just go on my phone and reorder it. Macy's app, I'll browse to see what I want to buy. I also uh, use a, an app called Gas Buddy. It tells you where the nearest cheapest gas is basically. I used it this morning. It was cheaper in Monterey to fill up one gas than it was in Fremont, so I filled up there. I sometimes email people pictures when I'm trying stuff on and I can't decide if I want to buy it. You know, yeah, actually, I make a picture. Yeah, I've okay. Done it before, yeah. Okay, does it, okay. Yeah. So there you go. I actually did that for my TV to see which one I took like a little, um, 
tally of not which one's better, plasma or LCD, and people gave me the responses that way on Facebook. Top shops, they're using four squares to put in promos where, let's say, if you're of the store, they'll give you, like, $10 off or 10% off. Um, I know places in the shopping center, like Max's Restaurant, if you check in, you get discounts on your food or special offers on deals of the day. Um, at Sprinkles, there's a word of the day, and you can use it to get free cupcakes or free drinks, usually. Yeah, Groupon's um, concert tickets and food. I mean, amazing thing about Groupon's, it makes you spend money on places you didn't think you would spend. On one incident, I was going to buy two items, but I knew that if I bought one item, I was going to get a $10 note card. So I've only bought one item and waited till I got the note card, and then I went back and bought the second item with the note card. <laughs> That's great. She is pretty clever. <laughs> so what is it that we're seeing right here? I mean, all this translated into into something that, like, some, some more fundamental theories, and we, I, I personally love academics, so uh, theories are always good. Um, there's some marketplace rules that never change, and they don't change just because technology has entered. And one of those, for example, is that if in any given trading situation you have two partners exchanging goods for financial products, for example, um, it's always the one making the better deal who has more information. So um, you, have, you have an equilibrium sometimes, or you sometimes have, have um, a disequilibrium where you have um, somebody has more information, that means that person can make more money or gets the better deal out of the transaction. Um, the other one is, um, how, however tight your bottleneck is, the better your margin is in any given situation. There's a good example, the music industry, as we all know, um, they were controlling distribution of content as long as they had CD-ROMs. So they were con controlling the amount of CD-ROMs that was out there in the market. As soon as CD-ROMs were gone as a bottleneck for distribution, um, all the margins were gone. So those are two fundamental truths that don't change just because technology is all of a sudden in the marketplace or any given transaction situation. But what happens now is that shoppers have tools that allow them to overcome those. They allow them to shift certain situations so they have more information in any given transaction situations. They're allowed, they can overcome those bottlenecks. They don't exist anymore. Another truth, and this is something that was quite interestingly told to us by Facebook, um, it should have been told to us probably by, by, by Gap or by Ikea, was um, if you look at the success for retail, it's all about, it's three truths that, retail, that makes retail successful. It's location, it's location, it's location. So if you have that one store and that exactly, that intersection where everybody walks by, this is where you make the money. And whoever sits somewhere else, you have a problem. Well, all of a sudden, location, as a different place. Location is in your pocket. Location is on your cell phone. Location is in m-commerce with you. So there is something that all of a sudden a gap, for example, that thought they had such a great location in the middle of Soho where everybody would go to um, has to deal with that all of a sudden Diesel might have an m-commerce application that consumers have with them while they're at the Gap, while they're shopping for a pair of jeans in the Gap store, they have the diesel application where they can just buy that pair of diesel jeans and just leave the Gap store without doing any purchase in this. What this means for especially the folks of us that, that live more in the point of sale in the, in, the, in the shopper marketing area is we have to rethink shopper journeys. The typical shopper journey, the typical shopper journey in the, in the last 10 years, which started at, I want to buy something which was triggered by whatever, I don't know, I need a new PC, for example, started, I sat on my PC, I did my research, and then I looked at it and I did some comparison. I thought, this is what I'm going to buy. I went out, I walked, I potentially had a poster maybe on the way that influenced me, certain some kind of messaging. I potentially walked into the store and there was a sales staff that influenced me, but then I would make my decision, I'd buy this product. Well, the research phase now these days is never over because I have my cell phone with me. So we have to, as marketers, have to think about shopper journeys in a completely different way. It's not linear anymore. It's not from A to Z. But the shopper journey can start at any given point in time, and it can be influenced at any given point in time, not only by us in terms of what we would like the consumer to, that they buy our brand, but also by our competition. They can, make, they can influence that journey as well. So, and this is uh, because Harald said, um, do present something that gives some thought starters. And I know a lot of you are, are in the industry of inventing things and looking at, at what we can do with mobile. Um, here are some things from how we believe where, where we should start when we look at shopper journeys and we look at shopping behavior and where we think we can add true value versus just doing some another app um, where we can just see things somewhere in our neighborhood. First of all, a brand is never alone. Google just published a study um, where they said 
Um, the average consumer, and this goes pretty much across countries, has 30 apps on their phone. Um, they use nine apps of those within the last 30 days. If I start counting my apps on my phone, Facebook, um, Yelp, TripIt, uh, so on and so forth, there is not a single individual branded app on that phone that I'm using in the last 30 days. This is a huge concern because if Anheuser Busch, for example, does the Budweiser app to do something that might be nice and it will hit probably those three percent, but it doesn't hit the large majority that we're actually trying to target. So brands have to understand that, and, and beer is a good example because beer is being sold through a supermarket, they're not just there. There's some good news though, and the good news is that um, there is shelf space. Just as you have in the physical point of sale, there now is a virtual point of sale, which is on the phone. So um, apps like, for example, Target, and Target is a good example because they're kind of like the market leader in how they use mobile um, to not just sell through their physical supermarkets, but also sell um, through mobile devices, is they have shelf space right there. And just as you buy premium shelf space in the physical supermarket, you can now look into buying virtual shelf space. So there's, there's an opportunity right here. And whether that's being monetized by media companies or whether that's being monetized by advertising agencies or just by the supermarket themselves, um, that's where they go. There's another interesting one, check-in. So um, we, looked, we asked people, why are you checking in? And everybody would think, I check in because I get 10% off. Well, what people said is, I check in because I want to get loyalty programs. I check in because I need better customer service. I check in because I want to see if the product is actually in the inventory when I go into the store. So there are actually more opportunities here than just offering another 10% off. Empower staff. Think of it, if you, if you look at that situation where it's about information exchange at the point of sale, your staff has to have the same information as the shopper does. So why not look into opportunities of how the staff can have access to the same kind of information or potentially even more information through mobile devices while they're in the store? Understand social platforms. Social platforms is, is the use case there is on mobile phones. Um, Gap did a great thing. They, they basically said on, on Facebook, you know, if you check into any Gap location, uh, that's, the, that's the signal, right? Uh, if you check into any Gap location, you get 10% off that jeans. But what they did is they advertised it on Facebook first, they led the consumer to the point of sale, and then they had huge signage that the staff knew of this promotion. How often do we see these things where you check in and the staff has no clue of what's actually happening? Anticipating intent through data, um, we've just seen this data as the oil of the media industry, I think was, uh, was the quote. Um, there's so much more data that we can look at and the data allows us to overlay so many more dimensions that say, if Martin is on a Friday night, he's on his cell phone, it's nine o'clock and he has a couple buddies that checked in into the same place where he is, he's likely to have had already three beers and he's probably having a conversation about his ex-girlfriend rather than at nine o'clock in the morning uh, where he's sitting at his desk in his PC and where he's probably just starting work and reading emails that he had had come in on the weekend. So that, that allows us to anticipate of what um, the current state of mind of this person is right now. And then finally, and this is, uh, you, you took it already from me, but I, I just felt this is, uh, and, and I totally agree with you, this is probably one of the best cases there is when it comes to utility, to value, to understanding that it's not just about an app that does messaging and, and brings something out there, but which is really about um, understanding a context, understanding shopping behavior, and um, delivering true value for it. And I'm not going to play the same video because you've already shown it. Thank you.